On the topic of how do you thwart a cyber criminal using quantum optics, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Fox. So uh, thank you, Richard, I think, uh, for that in kind introduction. Thank you also to Chris and Adam for organising the event, Rob coming and interviewing me, but thanks especially to all of you for voting. It's a great chance to get a chance to talk about my subject. Uh, is I, any excuse to talk about physics? Uh, that's why, what we like to do. So anyway, um, what am I going to talk about? So uh, cyber thieves, using quantum physics to thwart them. However... Um, I want to start this lecture actually on a rather sad note. Um, many of my our physics students will know my colleague uh, Tim Richardson, who has, uh, after a long struggle with cancer, has sadly died yesterday. And I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Tim. I think Tim, this is about this, these lectures are about inspiration, and Tim really was uh, an inspiring lecturer, an inspiring person. Um, obviously, f students from physics will know Tim very well, and the sad as I am to hear of his loss, uh, but also uh, many of you will remember the, 24, the mad physics lecturer who did the 24-hour uh, physics uh, lecture marathon last year, and that was Tim, and it's a great loss to uh, the department, a great loss to the university, so I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Tim. Okay, so uh, what am I going to tell you about? Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, security on the internet. There's a number of topics I could have talked about, but it was interesting doing the interview with Rob. Uh, talked about a number of things, Star Trek, of course, uh, and um, other such interesting topics. Um, I noticed he edited out my diatribe about Richard Dawkins, um, which was uh, a bit of a pity anyway. I'll give you that any time if you like. Um, so, But anyway, he seemed to get interested when I started talking about... Uh, quantum internet, uh, you know, using your credit card on the internet, is it safe? You know, you type, um, I have done an internet purchase this afternoon, booked a train with, a uh, ticket with East Midlands trains, and I'm rather hoping that, oh, my money has gone to East Midlands trains, and I'm going to be able to get my ticket uh, when I go to the station, and it hasn't gone to some cyber thief. It was interesting, I tried to check the, um, you know, check all my emails. I didn't get an, a, a response immediately from East Midlands Trains, and I was worried about this, so I said, check your spam folder, and I found all sorts of stuff in the spam folder I didn't know was there. People told me I got a very uh, um, realistic thing from the uh, HMRC to declaring I got a tax rebate and all sorts of interesting things, so uh, watch out for those. There are plenty of cyber thieves out there. I'm afraid the tax man, he never gives you money back. Um, Anyway, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about security uh, on the internet. Um, how does it actually work? And I, don't, I hope you're not going to get worried about this. As I say, I have used it today, and I'm not worried. But, you know, in principle, we can do better. We can actually use quantum physics to do this. So I'm going to tell you about this quantum cryptography. And the key part of it is actually what single photon sources. So this is a, a light source. So this is a laser. This is chucking out zillions of photons every second. But I'm going to tell you about a little gadget, which I press a button, and it chucks out just one photon. And it's really hard to do that. And I'm going to tell you how we do it. And this is actually a key part of our research um, here in Sheffield. I've spotted a few of our graduate students who can tell you at the back. They can tell you all about this. And uh, then I'll finally tell you a little bit about where the state of the art is in this subject of quantum cryptography. OK, so I'm sure that at the end of this lecture, you'll all be rushing off to Amazon and you'll all be wanting to buy a copy of my book. So Richard said he didn't know what quantum optics is. Here's your chance. Just dash to Amazon and buy yourself a copy. Only 25 pounds and eight pence. A bargain. Do not buy any of these used copies. Uh, used copies are destroyed in this department. Okay. Um, anyway, now, um, so you've bought, you've just found this real bargain here on Amazon, and you are anxious to go and buy it. So you're going to press the button, add to basket. And then you'll go to checkout. And what happens when you go to checkout? And at this point, interesting, when you look at the top of the bar at the top of the internet, it sort of says HTTP Amazon. It says HTTPS. And the S stands for secure. And what's happening there? Well, at that point, you're doing this secure encryption. This is how the whole of internet security is working on, uh, when you go to Amazon. And it's using a thing called RSA encryption. Uh, RSA, they're just the abbreviation of three guys, Rivers, Shivat, 
I can't remember who A is. Anyway, um, these guys, uh, they were mathematicians, computer scientists, and they devised uh, this system which is called RSA encryption. And this is what happens when you start um, trying to type your credit card details into the Amazon uh, web page. So here's your computer, and there's Amazon's computer, and you are connected together through the internet. Okay? Now, so you start the secure transaction. At this point, Amazon's computer generates a thing called the public key. Public key is the product, it's a number, it's the product of two numbers, P and Q, and these numbers are prime numbers. So um, hopefully you remember what a prime number is. It's basically it's a number that can't be divided by another to get an integer, so um, no even numbers are prime numbers because they can always divide by two with, and not get a remainder, but odd numbers can be prime. So uh, three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime. Nine is not prime because nine is three times three. 11 is prime, 13 is prime, 15 is not prime because it's five times three. So get the idea of a prime number. The things that cannot be divided uh, to get an, uh, without a remainder. So anyway, Amazon's computer gener has a, generates two uh, prime numbers, multiplies them together, and then sends you this number. Now you have to assume that all thieves in the world have picked up this number. It's gone down the internet and that is not secure. Um, that uh, can be intercepted, as I'll explain in a minute. So you have to assume you've got that number, and so have Amazon. Okay. Now, um, what do you do? You get that. Your computer gets this, and it runs a program called RSA encryption. And it is basically you encrypt your data. So you codify your credit card number. So when you transmit your credit card number down here, you get basically garbage. Uh, this is completely unrecognizable because it's being coded uh, using this RSA encryption method. And so you get this um, encoded information here, which Amazon pick up, and then they decrypt it. They reverse the codification process, which your computer has done, and out of it they get their credit card details and they charge you £25.08. pence. Okay, hopefully. Now, obviously, well, this can't stop you from being an impersonator. You know, if you've got an impersonator of Amazon there, um, then you're and then you're stymied. Um, but presumably, Amazon are uh, out there trying to get rid of impersonators. You're on Amazon; they're big enough to stop that. Okay. Now, um, the whole point why um, this is secure because you have to assume everybody knows all the thieves know this key. They've also picked up your encoded credit card details. So the reason it is secure is because to reverse the codification, you need to know the original prime numbers. Um, everybody else just knows their product, but only Amazon know what P and Q are. Everybody else knows P times Q. And the point is, this encryption method is very difficult to reverse unless you know P and Q. So, um, basically, is it secure? It is not provably secure. It is not mathematically um, secure. If you could invent some clever method for finding the factors of a large number, you would break the RSA encryption method. You would, uh, its security would go overnight. Um, but the assumption is that it's very difficult to do this, to, do it, to reverse this. Now, I t if I tell you uh, a number um, I've already got 15. It's very quick for you to work out that 15 is not a prime number, and you can work out that it's 5 times 3. You can work out that 21 is 3 times 7. That's very easy. Um, if this number has 100 digits or more, it's going to be a bit more difficult for you to find what the original prime numbers are. And in fact, you'd need a very, very, very powerful computer. And even if you have the world's most powerful computer, it's going to take you years to find those products, P and Q, from their product P times Q, to find out what P and Q are. Because basically, as far as we know, there is no alternative but to just start dividing. You know, if I say, is um, 43 a prime number? Well, you in your head are now going to start, I divide by 3. You know, 3 doesn't divide, 5 doesn't divide, by 7 doesn't divide, okay. Um, for 11, uh, 13 doesn't divide, it's prime, okay. Uh, now, there's basically no alternative but to go through that process of doing that division, and that's going to take you a long, long, long time if you've got, um, 
if you've got a really huge uh, encryption method uh, number, right? So basically, um, the assumption of this is that uh, it's in practice secure, and that's secure. It's basically, you need a huge, a more powerful computer than anybody else has got in the world, and that's um, obviously that's um, only a very, very large organization might potentially have that. Um, so. Those sort of people, you know, the KGB, MI5, CIA, these sort of guys might have such a computer. If they had it, they wouldn't tell us, would they? So they might have it, but they're probably not bothered with my credit card. They're going to go after bigger fish. Alternatively, you might have the world's cleverest mathematician who has solved a problem that all the world's mathematicians have been unable to solve. Now, if that person had found that solution he'd be out there trying to get his Fields Prize. He'd be giving lecture tours, creating in uh, guest lecture tours everywhere. Again, I don't think he'd be bothered with my, um, my uh, credit card details. So I am happy using RSA encryption. But, you know, you never know. The KGB might be listening. Who knows? Um, and there are lessons from, uh, from history. We know the Enigma machine um, was used during World War II, and it, it was thought uh, by the Axis forces to be... Uh, secure, but in practice it wasn't. We had cracked it. We had cracked it by using uh, a powerful, well, in those days, a powerful computer, and also there were human errors as well, which one way or another were together allowed us to crack that code, but it was thought to be uncrackable, and we cracked it, so who knows? So I'm now going to tell you about a way to do send data which is completely secure. It is provably secure. And it's, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, a method called uh, the one-time pad, or the Vernum cipher. This was a name of a person. Basically, what's going to happen is you've got your message, which you want your secret message, and you're going to encode it using what's called a, a key, okay? And this will produce an encrypted message. And then you, to get to decrypt it, you basically just subtract the key. And the way for this to be secure is this key has to be random, has to be a random number, has to be as long as the message, and you can only use it once. As soon as you start using it more than once, then the security goes. You start, you can do pattern spotting and so on. So if you only use it once, um, it's secure. It's provably secure. So as a little example, I'm going to divide a, a very primitive code. So A is 1, B is 2, Z is 26, and this will generate a digital number. So here is a digital number, 00001, that would be um, 16. Uh, no, hang on, that's 1, isn't it? Okay. Um, so anyway, this might be the encrypted message that you pick up. And here is my key. It's a random uh, binary number. If I subtract that from that, I get this in binary. And if you actually use your little code, this is fox is what this, this means. This, this thing here means fox using my encoded message. But if you don't know this key, it's completely, this is totally de undecipherable. There's no way you can work that out because this is complete, this is random numbers here because this is random. So the whole trick is if you've got this little key and you use it only once, then it is completely secure. But the problem is how do you uh, exchange the key? So you want to send a secret message obviously from one person to another, from A to B and they have to share the key. Now, we could meet together, I could write it down and give it to you. Hopefully there's nobody with a, he's got a camera here, he might check afterwards what I've written down and see if he can, you know, with super high uh, technology, see if he can read what I've written down, you know. But anyway, hopefully I can do it securely enough so that nobody else sees it. That's fine, if I meet you. What happens if you are in uh, York, for the sake of example? I cannot just, uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, I have here and you're there and I want to exchange that key. Now, somehow I, I could do it. So I could pick up the telephone and uh, tell you what the key is. But, of course, you have to assume all cyber thieves have picked that message up so it's not secure. So the trick is how can, I ex how can we exchange that key, that secret key, without anybody else picking it up? Okay. Now, the reason it's not secure is because... Um, Basically, I'm going to send my data. So typically, if I send it, pick up a landline and send it down over a phone line, the data is going down the phone line as a series of optical pulses. And the question is, is there somebody in the middle picking those pulses up and pinching uh, the message? You know, so they just tap it off and 
so they tap off a fraction of the data, so they copy these pulses, record them. Maybe they boost the signal again so that you don't notice that the signal has dropped, some of the energy's gone that way, and they can pick it up. And here, you know, here's the guy tapping the telegraph line. This is a phone tapper. You can buy these on the internet, $20. So um, now, who knows who's listening in? As we all know, it's been in the news. Lots of people listen in our phone messages. Don't the only security basically is that there's just too many of us. They're not interested in my phone calls. So uh, the news of the world aren't listening to me. At least I hope they aren't. Anyway, um, well of course they aren't because they don't exist. But maybe the uh, somebody else is right. Um, anyway, so what we're going to do is we are going to use quantum optics to exchange the key now. In, when we're in the quantum information, we have to introduce you to various characters. So we're sending data from A to B. A is called Alice, and B is called Bob. And you probably see how old I am from these pictures. Every quantum information lecturer, basically, they have different Alices and Bobs. Anyway, I thought um, for today's lecture, we might change it from Alice to Brian to be a bit more topical. OK, so we're trying to send a message from Alice to Brian, OK? And we're going to send this message um, on a single photon. Okay, and that's a little packet of a particle of light. And the question is, is there somebody in the middle eavesdropping? So this person in this middle in the middle is called Eve. Okay, Eve for eavesdropper. Could be Eve for evil. You know, it's an evil person trying to steal your information. Okay, um, so we're going to send the information. Now, how is it going to work? So we're going to use this send uh, information encoded onto individual photons, one bit, one binary bit of information at a time on this photon going from Alice to Brian. And the point is we are going to detect whether Eve is there pinching our data, eavesdropping on our data, because we're going to apply fundamental laws of quantum physics. It's basically, which I'll explain in the next slide, but because of fundamental properties of quantum systems, um, it basically means we are going to be able to know whether Eve is there. And the point is we're using this to exchange the key. We're not actually sending the secret message. We're exchanging the code, if you like. Once we've exchanged the code successfully, and we know that nobody has pinched it, then we're going to send our secret message encoded with that code. So if they do intercept, if there is an eavesdropper, they haven't got the secret information. Okay? They can spoil our little game, uh, but you know you can always do that. There are other ways of breaking the communication channel, um, but at least you will not give away any confidential information. Right. Now, so how does it work? It basically works on the principle, a very, a very fundamental principle of quantum physics, is that essentially what's going to happen is, is that if we make measurements on individual particles, individual quantum systems, we end up basically changing them. So the way we're actually going to encode the data, we're going to encode the data onto what's called the polarization of the, um, of the photon. The photon is a little, an individual light particle. If we fire this photon towards you, say, then the beam is going in this direction, and the, uh, the photon, classically, we think of it as an electromagnetic fit wave, and it has a little electric fields which are oscillating. So if I fire the beam to you, the, this, um, the photon can be oscillating up and down or sideways or any other sort of direction. We actually encode the information onto the direction of uh, polarization of this photon. And so what Eve is going to do is she's going to try and measure that uh, polarization angle there without being noticed. But she cannot do this because this is one of the really interesting and neat things about quantum physics is that you can't, it's basically measurements are invasive. You can't measure things and not change them afterwards. Now, for those of you on physicists will be familiar with this, but for those of you who are not physicists, this might be a bit strange. So I thought I'd use a classical example. So here we are. Here is a piece of string. How long is a piece of string, you might ask? So if I were to ask you this, I could get my ruler out and I can measure it, right? Okay, so I get my piece of string and I get about uh, 27 centimeters. So this piece of string is 27 centimeters. Now, I could give you this piece of string and you could get your ruler out and you could measure it yourself. And hopefully you would also get 27 centimeters uh, for the answer of this length of this piece of string. 
And it would not be, it would be very surprising if the fact that I have measured it and then I give it has actually changed the length of the string. You would hope that the length of the string that you get, and we both measure the same piece of string, and we haven't altered it by just uh, putting it up against my ruler. But that doesn't work. That's what happens on the big scale. This doesn't work down on individual uh, particles. If we actually look at one photon, one atom, we try and measure its properties. Every time we come in and measure it, we will. basically the measurement is a very... A clunky, invasive process, and it will actually change the state of that photon. Uh, and we will not. So, if we've measured, tried to measure the state of the photon, it's going to affect the answer we get if we measure it again. And this is you have to talk to your friends who are physics students, who will give you a full explanation of this. It's an interesting point about this: is it's what's called the quantum no cloning theorem. So, the idea is if you could measure it. Um, then you could basically measure, say, the state of a photon, extract the information from it, and then generate a new photon with the same properties. So you could clone quantum systems, but you can't do that. That's basically what's called the quantum no-cloning theorem, and uh, basically it means you just cannot do this. So if you, Eve comes in, she tries to measure uh, this polarization angle here, she's going to change it. And what's going to happen is um, Alice and Brian are going to do some error checks on the data they receive, and they're going to note on a little subset of data, and they're going to notice. So Alice will eventually tell her, um, sends these things, and he will actually tell what answer Brian should have got. He's going to notice that he's getting different answers because Eve's been in here messing things up. So he's going to notice that Eve's there, and he will therefore decide, "Ooh, we've had an eavesdropper here. I am not going to. We're not going to use this key. It's not secure." Okay, so that's how it works. Now, the whole trick is, uh, for it to work, is basically we need just a single photon. So a photo, we, this is a, I say, this is a beam of laser light uh, throwing out loads and loads of photons. Now, these are little light, uh, light particles, if you want to think of them that way. And what we want is a gadget that will actually, we trigger it, we press some button, if you like, and out comes one photon. And this is not any old light source. This is a very special type of light source. The trick actually is, to make it work, is you have to isolate a single atom or something similar to that. What you do is you put some energy into this atom and it will basically then only re-emit one photon. So the principle is shown here. Yeah, this is a bit technical. I hope the physics students will understand this. For the rest of you, I hope you understand some of it. Anyway, this is a, an atom, say, and an atom has many quantum states in it. And what we do is if we put some energy into that atom, we move the electrons from their lowest state, which is the state they're naturally in, into some higher state. And then afterwards, they don't like being in this higher state. You know, electrons are lazy, basically. They always try and go to the bottom, you know, to the lowest state. So they go to the highest state, and then they drop down through a series, perhaps, of intermediate states. And each time they do this, they give off a photon. And the these photons have very characteristic colors. And um, basically, so every atom has a whole signature of photons, which you can give out, very clear colors. Okay? And so we'll only ever get, as we isolate one fo atom, we'll only ever get one photon out at a time. Okay? So we'll only, in this particular atom, I only ever get one blue photon out if I, every time I excite this atom. So what I'm going to do is I, I'll excite it with a pulse train, and then every time it'll re-emit a photon, okay? And um, uh, we'll only get one photon alone. But the trick is, to make it work, it only works if you isolate a single atom, and then you use a spectral filter to isolate one of these uh, little photons here. Okay, now, um, so what do we work on in Sheffield? Well, we're very interested in um, solid-state sources. So now here's a number of different examples. What I'm going to tell you about these ones here, they're called quantum dots. You can see I'm running out of time here. By the way, if I go on too long, I can go on all night. So just when you're getting bored, just um, give a yell and I'll um, stop. Okay, um, so these are actually, we work on these here in Sheffield. They're, we uh, actually host a very large research center, national research center for three, five technologies. These are a particular type of crystals, very special light-emitting crystals. Um, and they're called made from 3-5 semiconductors. And this is 
um, a no collaboration of a number of universities, but in particular, Sheffield is the lead university. What we use is a very complicated machine here called a molecular beam epitaxy machine. And it actually generates these tiny little nano crystals. Okay, so this is a little lump of crystal, but it's only maybe 10 or 20 nanometers across. And these are actually grown. So it's like, imagine a, sili a chunk of silicon. It's not silicon, it's a silicon-like object. It's like a silicon chip. But inside of it, you've got these tiny little uh, nanocrystals. And these are going to be our, like our individual atoms. Now, the problem is that when we make these, we get millions of these little quantum dots, as we call them. We, it's only going to work if we isolate one of them. So we have to use tricks to isolate single quantum dots. So what we actually do is we have all these different dots here. And sometimes we just put a little aperture. So we block out the light from all of the dots. And we have a tiny little nano aperture. So there's probably only going to be one quantum dot underneath our aperture. Alternatively, we can actually make little what are called micro pillars. And this is, for the physicists here, this is what you actually see. from. If you don't have the aperture, you see a very broad emission from loads and loads of quantum dots, all emitting at slightly different colors. Then you put the aperture in, and then you start seeing uh, the individual photons for the individual colors coming out of the quantum dot. Alternatively, you can make these rather nice-looking things. This is a little micro pillar. You can see the sort of sign. These things are all made in Sheffield. So this is a, a basically this semiconductor chip, and it's been etched away, so you have this little pillar here. Down here, you've got a mirror, two mirrors, and in the middle, you have the quantum dot, and light bounces around inside here, and so it actually enhances the emission rate of this quantum dot. Rather nice-looking thing here. Okay. Now, um, suppose we've got one of these. The interesting thing is, how do we know we've only got one photon coming out at a time? And here we have to introduce you to two characters. Here, there's a, this chap here, Robert Hanbury Brown, and his colleague, Richard Twist. Now, Twist seems to be a very mysterious guy. Nobody in the field of quantum optics can find a picture of Twist. We don't know why. I don't know if he's, his family go around there. He's dead now. Um, but anyway, his family go around there deleting all photographs of Twist. But anyway, these guys, Hanbury Brown and Twist, they did some really interesting experiments at Jodrell Bank in 1955-56. If you ever go to Jodrell Bank and you mention these guys, People look at you with a blank expression on their face. They've never heard of them. And the reason is their contribution to astronomy um, was rather minor. They were actually trying to measure star sizes, and they made improvement in the techniques uh, to uh, measure star sizes. Um, so astronomers aren't interested in these two guys. Little do they know, these two guys basically founded a whole new branch of physics. Um, but the astronomers aren't interested in other branches of physics. They don't know about this. Okay, so what they did is they did these experiments, which relevance to astronomy is a long story, which I don't have time to tell you. Okay, um, but anyway, what they did is a rather clever little trick. So basically, you take your light beam and then you split it. It's what's called a half-silvered mirror, perhaps. It's like a, you can imagine it, you send the photons in and you toss a coin. Do they go... Um, on or do they go down? It's a 50-50 split and it's basically it's a half silvered mirror which partially reflects light, partially transmits it and you can arrange so that the probability of being transmitted or reflected are the same. So in comes the stream of photons and then they go on to two detectors okay? and these detectors are super sensitive detectors that can only, they can actually register individual photons so they count the photons and if you say a photon comes here uh, you get a little click, if you like, on it, a pulse, and you start a timer, and then another photon sometime later hits this one, and then it stops, and then you measure the time between these two events. And the really neat thing is, you see, if you're only putting one photon in at a time, you will never get any events with small times between them, because if the photon comes on, goes to that detector, well, it, that's the stop, so it doesn't create an event. If it goes to this detector, it gets a start, but there's no other photon there to give you an event at time zero. Whereas if you put a bunch of photons in at the same time, some of them go this way, some of them go that way, and they hit them at the same time, so you do get events at uh, the same time. So this is what's called a Hanbury-Brown twist interferometer. They're very clever guys. Um, so uh, this is some data which we took in Sheffield, and this is what happens is you have a pulsed laser coming in. There's your little quantum dot. And then we're looking at the light coming out. Okay, and this is what you actually see. So 
This is, we're hitting it with a pulsed laser. So what's going to come out are pulses of light, and they're going to this Hambry Brown twist experiment here. So if the pulse comes along, if it goes to the stop detector, you don't get any events. But the pulse goes on to this uh, avalanche, di uh, this detector here, and starts the timer. And then you just wait until you get another click on this detector. So what you actually see is a whole series of spikes in this, with his time along here. And the separation between these is the time between the pulses. So, you know, you can get a, a, a pulse coming in here, starting it, and then another pulse comes in, goes there, and stops it. But the neat thing is, if you look, there are no uh, events occurring at time zero. That's telling you that there's only one photon in the pulse, because if the photon started an event, there couldn't be one there. You have to wait till the next pulse comes along, the next photon comes along, before you can get a click on this detector and register an event. So this shows you this is emitting a single photon source, uh, photons at a time, and this is what we work on here in Sheffield. So I'll just spend the last couple of minutes telling you about how you use this in where the, this cryptography system, where it is. So there are two basic methods that people are thinking about. One is actually sending single photon source and sending these photons from Alice to Brian, sending them through the air, through free space. And there have been a number of really neat experiments. This is one uh, which the astronomers here might recognize. This is, um, these are the Canary Islands, uh, La Palma and Tenerife. Uh, and these are, have telescopes on top. They've got really good optics labs on the top of mountains. Really beautiful, clear air. Excellent for firing uh, photons over long distances. And this is you know, actual real picture. This is on La Palma, and there's Tenerife, 143 kilometers away. And there have been quite a lot of um, quantum optics experiments done firing these photons through the air from the telescope at the top of one mountain on La Palma to another one on the top of Tenerife, and they've done quantum cryptography. They've also, I promise I'd mention Star Trek. Star Trek, um, the, tele, uh, the transporter, it's a teleporter, a quantum teleporter, and they have done quantum teleportation between uh, this telescope here and the telescope on the top of uh, Tenerife. Now, probably the realistic goal of what they're trying to do, thinking here for realistic secure communication, especially probably military applications. You imagine this is a spy satellite here. They want to send secure data up and down to space. So that actually, that's why they're really thinking about these free space uh, quantum cryptography systems. They want uh, ultra secure communication with satellites. Okay, now the other option is actually to send uh, the data down optical fibers. I mean, normally this is how data is transmitted. Um, you know, down your phone, your internet, it's going down an optical fiber link down between the uh, computers. So you actually want to send the data down an optical fiber. So um, where's this going? So the state of the art here um, has been done by a group in Switzerland. And they've actually managed to set up a quantum cryptography, uh, quantum key exchange underneath Lake Geneva, down optical fibers, running 67 uh, kilometers down there. So that's the state of the art here using, there's their kit. So this is sort of semi-commercial now. I thought I'd show you. Here's a couple of companies uh, that work in it. This is this one in Switzerland, ID Quantique. And you could go out and buy this. It's rather expensive, um, but you can, in principle, buy this and set it up. And maybe, you know, you could imagine there probably is one of these running from the White House to the Pentagon, um, you know, for top security from uh, number 10 Downing Street to... Uh, MI5 headquarters. I presume there probably is one of these running. You can buy Toshiba. There are a number of companies um, that are actually working on this. So anyway, I think I've already overrun my time a long way. So I just thought I'd tell you what I like about this topic is, well, basically, it's something really used. Internet security is a big issue. If you work for a bank, they are really worried about internet security. Obviously, if you're MI5, the army, government, um, uh, they're really interested. And we are, of course. You know, we don't want people nicking our credit card numbers. So it's a really big issue. And quantum cryptography is a totally secure way of doing um, data transmission. And it's a really neat example of quantum mechanics in action. This is something that you just simply cannot do in classical physics. Um, you need that property of quantum physics that the measurements are invasive to make it work. And it's a really active research topic. And just thought to finish with one last interesting application of this. This is um, Geneva. There's a group in Switzerland who I say they're very active. They actually decided they were going to, you know, voting was really crucial. So they actually installed um, 
a quantum cryptography system in Geneva for transmitting the results of the votes in a parliamentary election in 2007. So there's an interesting example of um, quantum cryptography in action. 